right. Hey, everyone. Hope you're having a great holiday weekend so far. Welcome to Real Life. My name is Jake, and if we have yet to meet, I sure would love to change that very soon. Uh, hey, last week, for the first time, we talked to you as the 10 o'clock crowd. We also talked to the 1130 crowd, and we said, hey, look around you, and you will notice that there aren't that many empty seats uh, especially on your way out, you're going to be passing the 1130 crowd and find there's not a lot of parking spots. And we're also learning that there's not as much kid space as we'd like. And we're kind of turning away kids on a weekly basis. And that, that breaks my heart. And so we asked you if you would consider as the 10 o'clock crowd starting to attend either the Thursday night or the 830 service. And a few of you did. You moved to the 830 service this morning. And I want you to know that we gave those people a thousand all right? So you really, you should have done it, all right? You really should have done it. I'm kidding. Could you imagine? And, uh, but here's what I'm asking, is that if you love this place and it's meant something to you, then if you would please consider that. Thursday night, 8.30, because here's why, is that uh, when your friend or when your family member or coworker that you've been praying for and you've been invited, uh, if they finally summon the courage to show up one day and then they can't find a place to park, or they don't have a place to take their kid, or, or they can't even find a seat in here, then that would be a bad experience. And we think people come to Jesus is a miraculous thing in itself, so let's not make it harder. If you would help us by moving your service attendance, that'd be so amazing. So thank you for considering it. Uh, Thursday night, 8.30, got plenty of space for you. Hope to see you there soon. Now today, we are wrapping up a message series called Some Things Never Change, because we acknowledge that we live in a sea of change. Things change around us all the time. I mean, if you just even think back, say 60 years, and think about what life used to be like then compared to what it is today, it feels like a different universe. I mean, take, for instance, this advertisement for a child restraint in an automobile in the 60s. <laughs> they straight up just tied ropes around kids, all right? That's all they had. It is amazing that anyone survived the 60s. I can't even believe we're still around. Uh, but at least it was only $2. You know, like, not bad. Not bad. Worth the risk. Today, car seats have pads and locks and straps. And it takes an engineering degree just to install into the car. But kids are much safer. Uh, or check out this advertisement for a vacuum in the 60s. Uh, apparently, people dressed in elegant evening wear to do the household chores. And you'll see here that it is, ex it, it is great for high pile shag rugs, which I'm assuming was relevant back then, but has nothing to do with us today. Today, we don't even stand up to vacuum our house. We just have employed a robot to do the job for us. It's way better, way better. Or think about the way we used to listen to music. People used to listen on vinyl records. No, no fast forward, no track skipping. Just you and a needle and hopefully good aim to find the song that you wanted to, to hear. Uh, and today we listen to music, well, I guess we're actually listening to vinyl again, all right? I didn't know this. Uh, Gen Z, I guess, is super into vinyl. In fact, vinyl sales have risen for the last 16 years in a row and have outsold CDs for the last two. So I guess some things change and then they change back to the thing that it used to be. But what we've done over the last few weeks is talk about what gives us courage and confidence to face the day is the fact that God's character never changes. It is our rock. It is our foundation on which we can build our life. Hebrews chapter 13 says it like this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we have celebrated thus far in the series that the mission of the church is still the same that God still reigns. Last week, we talked about how the Holy Spirit still empowers us with spiritual gifts so that we can serve the church body and community. And in fact, last week, there were 183 of you that signed up to join a team for the very first time in your life. Will you celebrate that with me? 183 new people <laughs> joining teams, allowing God to use their gifts. We cannot wait. But today we're going to wrap up and we're going to celebrate and embrace this truth that Jesus still saves. 
that even though he was living 2,000 years ago, and even though he was born in Bethlehem on the other side of the world, even though he spoke a different language than you and me, even though his day and age looks nothing like our day and age, the process and the steps to start finding Jesus And then the experience of what happens after we do is still the same. And so if you want to read along with me today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 19. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app or the Real Life app, and you're going to take some notes today, which I'd encourage you to do, uh, check out Luke chapter 19. And when you get there, you're going to see Jesus interact with a very unique individual. And if you ever read the Bible on your own, which I really hope you will, uh, in the New Testament, you will see a series of encounters that Jesus has with different kinds of people. For instance, there was one late night where Jesus talked to a religious scholar. And then later, uh, in a mid-afternoon, he spoke to a multiple-time divorcee at a well. He spoke to a military officer that was desperate to get hope for his sick little girl. He spoke to a rich young man who was having trouble letting go of his possessions. He spoke to a disabled man and all of his buddies who did everything they could to get their friend help. And he spoke to a cowardly government official that was more concerned with the concerns of the crowd than what was the right thing to do. And every time that we see Jesus interact with these individuals, it shows us what was important to him and what it looks like to find him. And in Luke 19, we're going to meet a a man, a man who had a very real obstacle that was keeping him from seeing Jesus clearly. There was a barrier in the way and he couldn't get around it. He couldn't get over it. He couldn't get through it. He needed to do everything within his power just to see Jesus for himself. And you might be here today, and that perfectly describes your season of life. You even, you want to believe, and you you actually want it to be true. You have that desire, but there is one obstacle. There's this one barrier. There's one thing from keeping you from seeing him clearly, one thing that's keeping you from placing your faith in him. It's, It's one big philosophical question that you just can't get past. It's one person that you love that's suffering with sickness and you can't figure out why God would allow that. There's one thing that's in the way and I'm hoping today that through this story in Luke 19 that you will discover the hope that is available to you. So let's check it out. Verse one, it says, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. and He was the chief tax collector in the region and had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. He said, Zacchaeus, quick, come down. I must, I love that word. He says, I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I've cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. So in Luke 19, we meet a man named Zacchaeus, and we quickly learn three specific things about his life. Uh, The first thing that we learn is that Zacchaeus was rich. He was rich, rich, like very, very wealthy. And he's called the chief tax collector of the region. Now, week one of this series, we met another tax collector, and his name is Matthew. And we learned that the tax collectors had become rich by ripping off all of their neighbors. They would go as representatives of Rome and make people pay their taxes, but then they would add an extra one or five or 20% on top and then pocket the difference. And Rome didn't care because they were getting their taxes. And the tax collectors were becoming rich but they were also hated by everyone around them. And so Zacchaeus was the chief 
tax collector, which means he was rich, rich, very wealthy, but also deeply disliked by all the people in his neighborhood. Number two, we learn that he was curious. He was curious. Uh, at this time in Jesus' ministry, he had developed quite a reputation. He was somewhat of a local celebrity, and he was teaching messages unlike anything that anyone had ever heard before. And he was healing people of lifelong diseases the doctors could not fix. And when you do that, it draws a crowd. So every time he would show up, like he does here in Jericho, a bunch of people would show up. But no one had to be there. These were the curious. I mean, we already learned that Zacchaeus was rich. He was a homeowner. He could have spent that day at Lowe's getting the materials to renovate that downstairs bathroom that he's always been wanting to do. He could have been doing anything with his time. But instead, he shows up because he wanted to see Jesus for himself. So he's rich and he's curious. And then the final thing we learn about him is that he was short. Right? He was very short. Now, many of you, uh, you resonate with Zacchaeus. That you have been spending your entire life bobbing and weaving behind the back of people's heads to see the stage at a concert. And you are empathetic to Zacchaeus' plight. And I want you to know that I spent about 10 minutes this week researching short jokes on the internet. But because of my maturity and because of my wisdom, I am not going to tell those jokes. I am going to be the bigger person. And for those of you that did not laugh at that joke, it just went over your head. All right, that's all I had to say. Those are actually the only two I can tell in church. The rest of them were wildly inappropriate. So uh, that's all you get. Uh, so here we have uh, Zacchaeus, who was rich, but by ripping people off. He was curious spiritually. He was vertically challenged. And we see him do three things that you and I actually have to do as well. It may not feel like you have a lot in common with Zacchaeus, but there are three things that he did in Luke 19 that, that you and I need to do as well. And, and I owe this outline to Pastor Tim Keller because he says there are activities within Zacchaeus' story that are essential to finding Jesus, and that process has never changed. So the first thing that Zacchaeus did and, and you and I have to do as well is, number one, you got to climb a tree got to climb a tree. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. In verses three and four, we see Zacchaeus take off in a dead sprint to get ahead of the crowd and then climb a tree to get a better vantage point of Jesus. Now, if you and I were hanging out in the community and we were at a local parade and all of a sudden we saw a full grown man wearing a Gucci suit and loafers, head out into a dead sprint and then climb a tree to get a better view of the oncoming marching band, you and I would look at each other and say, that's weird. Why is he doing that? Keep the children away from that man. I don't know what his deal is, but that is not what rich people do. That is beneath them. It's undignified. Those are the kind of people that have the VIP seats in the front. You don't run in Italian leather, and you definitely don't climb a tree. What's up with that guy? But in order for Zacchaeus to get the clear view of Jesus that he so desperately needed, he had to surrender what is the primary barrier that keeps people from Jesus. And the primary barrier that keeps people, maybe you and me included, from Jesus is pride. It's pride. Finding Jesus requires a surrender of this dignity that we hold so dear. It requires us to let go of the illusion that we have it all figured out. It makes us surrender our perceived self-importance. And quite frankly, for some of us, even here today, that is just one step too far. See, the message that, that we've been have. Have, has been delivered to us throughout our years by the world is that at some point, you gotta grow up. Like fairy tales are fine for kids, but adults, you, you gotta get real. What do you mean you believe in a God that you can't see? And what do you believe that this guy that lived 2,000 years ago, how could you possibly put your life in his hands? At some point, you have to grow up and believe what everyone else believes. Believe that there is no divinity. Believe that there is no intelligent design. Believe that there is really no purpose to this life. And once it's over, it's over. It's like it never happened in the first place. A real message of hope. 
It says eventually the world is trying to tell us only the kids still believe. Eventually people are going to grow out of that. And Jesus knew that that would be one of the critiques of the faith. And instead of getting defensive about it, he leaned into it. There was this one day where Jesus and the disciples were debating greatness. And Jesus invites a little kid and puts him right in the middle of the circle and then says this. He says, I tell you the truth. Unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, when Jesus was describing a childlike faith and encouraging you and I to have one of those, he didn't mean one of ignorance or oversimplicity. Instead, he was encouraging his disciples to regain the imagination that the world wants to beat out of us. An imagination that says, maybe there is more to life than what I can see right in front of me. And maybe this beautiful world that I get to live in day in and day out wasn't just an accident, but was created by a very good God. And maybe not only did that God create everything that I see and taste and, and feel, but also he loves me and has pursued me, and has promised an eternity for me. And then on top of that, do you know what kids are really good at? Kids are really good at asking for help. They ask for help all the time. My kids will not stop asking me for help. They ask me to do everything. I gotta get that thing off the shelf because they're too short. I gotta open that can because they can't do it themselves. I gotta unlock their bike because they don't know the code. I got to print off their homework on the printer because they don't have access to Wi-Fi. I got to do everything for them. And it's because kids are very comfortable with their own limitations. So you and I, as we grow up and become adults, we just fall under the illusion that we have everything that we need, that we can do it all, that we can answer it all, and we don't need any help. But what Zacchaeus knew is that he was so curious and he was so desperate that he was willing to surrender his pride to admit that he needed a savior. So he climbed a tree. Here's the second thing that Zacchaeus did and you and I have to do as well, is that Zacchaeus had to get over the crowd. There was this group of people that was causing a literal barrier to keep Zacchaeus from Jesus. And in verse seven, we read that they were not spiritually curious, they were spiritually arrogant. They thought they had figured it out. They weren't there to learn from Jesus. They wanted to trap Jesus or discourage Jesus from his message. And this is the group of self-righteous people that often keep us away. If the primary barrier that keeps people from Jesus is our individual pride, then the secondary most prevalent barrier is the self-righteous crowd. It's the group of people that are so convinced and they are so self-assured and live in such a judgmental way that it repels people from faith instead of drawing them in. And if right now that's getting your blood boiling a little bit, because it's not theoretical for you, it's personal for you, you know that I'm describing that coworker that you're going to see on Tuesday or that family member that's going to be at the birthday party later this weekend and and it gets you so fired up because they seem so full of themselves and they want to talk down to everyone else. If that bothers you, I want you to know that it bothered Jesus as well. When you look at all the different interactions that he had with different people in the New Testament, sometimes he would meet people that were so far from God, they weren't even pretending to follow, they knew they were a mess. And Jesus was gentle and he was kind, he was truthful but he was loving as he did it. And then you would meet people that believed they had more figured out than Jesus himself. And with them, he would be pretty direct and sometimes a little harsh, but always truthful. You see, Jesus was, he was tough on the self-righteous and he was gentle with sinners. And so if that's you right now, and like that's, that's your thing, you just can't get over. You see all the hypocrisy, you see all the judgmentalism and you're like, if that's what it means to follow Jesus, then I'm out. May I, as kindly as I can say this, just because some follow Jesus poorly doesn't mean he's not worth following, all right? 
Listen, it is unavoidable that there are some people in this world that are very selective about the sin that they're willing to speak out against and then the sin they're willing to excuse. And there are some people out there that are so convinced of their goodness that they sit in other people's and sit in judgment of other people's badness. There are some that, that the power of grace has yet to produce the, the gentleness and the humility and gratitude it was designed to create. But can I also say that doesn't make Jesus any less spectacular. And it doesn't make him any less holy. And it doesn't make the gospel any less life changing. Just because there's some people in your life that that probably represent him poorly doesn't mean he's not worth following. And so again, as your friend, can I just say this as gently and directly as I possibly can? You may have to get over how religious and harsh your mom was when you were growing up to see Jesus for yourself. You may, you may, have to work through the fact that your dad was really judgmental and he was really bigoted toward a certain group of people, but he claimed to follow Jesus and that pushed you away from him. You need to see Jesus for who he is. And you you may, you might have to work through some of that church hurt that is very real and has left some very real wounds from that church experience that you walked out of that was legalistic and, and uptight and judgmental to find what, God always intended. But can I say, don't let those people be the reason to keep you from Jesus. He is so good and he is so loving and he is so worth following. So first Jesus climbed a tree. Then he, or first Zacchaeus climbed a tree. Then he had to get over the crowd. Here's the third thing he had to do was take Jesus home. He had to take Jesus home. See, Jesus went over to Zacchaeus' house, and they didn't just like watch a ball game together. They had a meal together. He spent significant time in Zacchaeus' house. And what's important for us to observe here is the order in which this hangout happened, because it's the order of grace. And unfortunately, we get this order mixed up sometimes, and it has real consequences in our lives. When Jesus pulled up to Jericho, uh, Zacchaeus was just the guy wearing Gucci up in the tree. He, he hadn't changed his life. He hadn't asked for forgiveness. He hadn't made amends with anyone. He was the same guy as he was the day before. Jesus showed up, and Zacchaeus didn't invite him over. Jesus invited himself over to Zacchaeus' house. And Zacchaeus' life change wasn't to earn Jesus' love, It was a response to Jesus' love. Sometimes we get this order mixed up. We we think of God as if he's kind of like sitting back, arms crossed, just looking at his watch, waiting for us to get it right long enough. Finally get to know those answers. Maybe earn our way into his favor and then we could have Jesus over. But I want you to see that Jesus invited himself over to Zacchaeus' house before Zacchaeus could clean all the empty bottles out of the living room. He said, I want to see you and I want to be in your life. Friends, grace comes first. Obedience comes second. And when we invert that order, that's where we get things really complicated. But I want you to notice that something always happens. There is always a response. Zacchaeus here, just imagine being the chief, tax, the chief tax collector in Jericho. Like it's, yeah, you're rich, but no one wants to hang out. Yeah, you can buy anything that you want, but no one wants to experience it with you. And here comes the most important person that's ever walked the earth, and he looks at you in a tree, calls you out by name, and invites himself over to your house. Zacchaeus had experienced love and grace unlike anything that he had ever experienced in his life. And his response to extravagant grace was extravagant generosity. See, the Bible, it teaches us to give away 10% of our earnings so that we will learn to trust God with the other 90%. Zacchaeus said, I'm doing 50. The Bible teaches those of us that that need to make amends with people to pay them back what we owe them plus 20%. Zacchaeus said, I'm doing 400%. He went way above and beyond any biblical command not to make Jesus love him, but because he was already loved. Friends, the truth is grace changes everything. The reason that we need to take Jesus home is because Jesus didn't come and live the perfect life here on earth 
and then go to the cross in our place, overcome our ultimate enemy, death, and then promise us a perfect eternity so that you and I would very graciously add one hour of activity to our weekly calendar. The reason we can't just leave Jesus here is because we need to take him home because he was designed to permeate every part of our life. He's not just adding a little bit of activity to what we do day in and day out. He wants to be a part of all of it. And so he doesn't just change our Sunday morning. He changes how we work and what we post online, how we spend our money. Jesus changes our family life, our our school life, our sex life. He he changes how we vote and then how we treat people that vote differently than us. He changes how we treat our bodies and if and how we care for the poor. And that's just to name a few of the things. It's when we lay down our pride, get over the crowd to see Jesus clearly for ourselves, take him home and allow access to everything that we will see the change that God always intended. Today, uh, as we wrap up this series, I'd love for you to hear one more real life story. It's our friend Casey. And Casey experienced the life-changing grace of Jesus and he wants to share with you how he's seen it change his life. Go ahead and check out Casey's story. Hi, my name is Casey. This is my real life story. My experience with God growing up, my whole dad's side of the family, they were all Catholic, and my parents would take us when we were kids, me and my my other sister, but it fizzled, the effort fizzled. I knew there was a heaven, and I believed in God, and really the only times I went to church was when I would go see my dad's side of the family on Christmas. So that was like my one trip a year, and I just never really got to know who Jesus was or, or the wisdom of God. With that weak foundation in my 20s, I really just kind of left on my own and living like free spirited. I started to actually like deny that there was a God and I would kind of laugh at people because I didn't understand faith. So I get through my 20s and I just realized the world is so crazy and it it becomes like hopeless and depressing and you almost just want to like completely ignore the entire world and just surround yourself in a bubble. At least that's what I did, you know, like, all right, I'm just going to focus on me. And even then it was still like, something's missing. I did know that there was good versus evil. That battle was always present in my mind or just seeing so much evil in the world and feeling like the despair from it all. It led me to want to find the good. And it kind of brought back the little bit of faith I did have as a child, you know, going to church and believing there was a God. It's like, you know, I need to start answering that curiosity and read the Bible for myself. And instead of like doom scrolling on Spotify, looking for something pointless to listen to, like another podcast, I put on the Bible and my jaw was on the floor and I was finding so many references to like the world we live in. I was like, this is where all these references come from. So I first met Drea at our job where we work. We hit it off right away. I loved her energy and her fun going like attitude. I just started telling Drea, hey, I started listening to the Bible. This is crazy, did you know this? Did you know that? And she was like, whoa, no, I didn't know that. And she said, you know, I never read the Bible either. The next thing we know, we're watching services online and it was an amazing service. They were going through the story. It just floored us. We just kept diving deeper and deeper. Now it's just all in. It's, the, the, I can't even look at the world the same. I can't even watch or listen to the stuff I used to before. It, it, it's really like a 180, you know, but in the right direction, you know, so. I started reading in January. She left at the beginning of February. It's like any couple, you know, we kind of had the bumps in the road along the way. I remember when she left just being like, It's in God's hands. It was that weekend service on Sunday where I came in, just like breaking down, you know, sitting by myself and getting real emotional. And I remember hearing Corey say, if you need a prayer right now, come up. And I I came up and I kind of just told him what was going on. I broke down my story real quick. Like, hey, I was confused my whole life. And then I kind of went away on my own path and started reading. Like I heard the Holy Spirit talking to me to pick up the Bible and I see it all now. I have all the answers I've been looking for. Corey and Kelly almost like prayed that over me, like giving me strength and praying for me and Drea. And I (laughs) just overcome with the motion. I go outside and I'm kind of just wandering around. I turn around and I'm kind of like gazing into the crowd and boom, I see her like on the curb just staring at me. And I could tell like that service had affected her like it did me. I could see her eyes, you know, and I go over and 
Yeah, it was just a look and a hug, and like I felt like we had reconnected again. And and at the time, I didn't realize how powerful that was. But I see it now. Yeah, that was God. That was the Holy Spirit working His powers through other people, and then reconnecting us. We were about to call it quits, and Jesus knew. They said, "No, what you guys have is something special," and He brought us back together. Like truly, and now he's the center of our relationship, and I've been shown that, like the, the the triangle, you know, and Jesus is at the top. The closer we are to Jesus, the closer we're gonna be to each other. So I would say in our relationship, what was missing was was Jesus. I see that now. So 2,000 years later, Jesus is still saving. Jesus can save your past, your present, your future. He can save your relationship, your marriage, whatever it is. I know that if you put your strength and faith in Jesus, he'll carry you all the way. <laughs>I believe is there's two groups of people here today, and maybe you're in the first group and you're, you're new to this. Like, this is a lot to take in. I'm not sure how you got here today. Maybe your mom invited you, or maybe a friend told you you were going to brunch, and then they snuck attack you and brought you in here, or whatever the reason. Man, I, I just want you to know I don't think it's an accident. And maybe you are curious, and in fact, you much like Zacchaeus, like you've just been trying to see around all the things that keep getting in your way and you can see Jesus clearly now. Like Casey was talking about, it's when he went to God's word and saw Jesus for himself that it transformed his life. And I want you to know that if you're on that verge of making that decision, that's something we wanna help you do. In fact, there's a, a symbol that we celebrate around here called baptism. And baptism is this public declaration of maybe something that's been private for a while, but it's when we say that we're all in. That it doesn't mean that we got it all figured out. It doesn't mean that we've put our act together. It just means we believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that he will do what he says he will do, and we want to see how he will change us as we go forward. So if that's you today, I want you to put a date on the calendar. October 3rd and 6th is the next baptism weekend. And that's where we're going to celebrate many people that are ready to declare that same truth in their lives. One thing I want you to know that here at Real Life, we do not do the polite golf clap when people make that decision. We go big and loud because we're convinced it's the greatest decision you'll ever meet, make. And we also believe that we are joining a party that's being thrown in heaven that celebrates when one person comes home. We cannot wait to celebrate with you on the first weekend of October. Then there's another group of people, and God changed your life a while back. That grace got a hold of you, and it has changed you, but there are people in your life that need to know who Jesus is clearly. Not for what the crowd says, not for what they see on the news, maybe not even for what you say, but to see Jesus clearly themselves. And God has put those people in your path so that you can bring them along. And so that's why we've been talking so much over the last few weeks about this series called Homecoming. And it begins on September 12th and 15th. And we're asking you to bring that person that you wish was sitting next to you right now. The person that's looking, the person that has questions, the person that you love, so that they can understand grace clearly. It's going to be fun, it's going to be exciting, and it's also going to be super helpful to everyone that already believes and those that are asking those big questions. And so be praying about who you can bring with you. Tell them they can sit with you. Tell them that you will buy them lunch, whatever it takes to get them next to you so that they can see Jesus work in their lives. Every week we pause with a symbol called communion. And communion is our reminder of what Jesus did on our behalf. It's it's why we sing the songs. It's why we celebrate. It's why we gather on a weekly basis. It's because Jesus is that good that he would go to that length to die in our place, to save us from our sin. There's bread and juice that represents his body and blood. And if you didn't grab the, the communion elements on the way in, all you got to do is raise your hand. One of our awesome volunteers will make sure you get what you need. And if you're here today and all this is new, Church is new, God is new, faith is new. It's kind of overwhelming. I want you to know there is no obligation for you to participate at all. You can simply use this moment to reflect on what you've already heard today. But I also want you to know, like all, all our cards are on the table. We pray for you every week 
that today will be the day that God will grab a hold of your heart and you will never look back. There will be some scripture on the screen that you can read and simply just think about what you've already heard. For those of us that are followers of Jesus, this is our opportunity to remember so you can take communion in your own time.